Bon, boa noite a todos. Uh, Hallo, herzlich willkommen im Namen des uh, Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums. Ich freue mich sehr, uh, alle heute hierher sehr herzlich um, zu Will willkommen zu heißen. Um, mein Name ist Laura Teixeira, ich arbeite hier im ähm, Deutschen Filmmuseum und ich freue mich sehr, dass wir heute nach einer kurzen Pause ähm, wieder mit der Reihe Lecture in Film Tropical Underground ähm, los äh, werden. Ähm, wir haben eine sehr schöne äh, erste Hälfte des, dieser Reihe hinter uns, die im Oktober angefangen ist. Ähm, viele von Ihnen haben das sicherlich schon äh, ein paar Mal äh, hier mit uns auch Filme geguckt und äh, Vorträge gehört, die auch sehr spannend waren. Und heute fangen wir, wie gesagt, die zweite Hälfte, jetzt im Sommersemester. Ähm, bis Juli haben wir sehr, ein sehr schönes Programm auch und ich freue mich sehr, äh, Sie alle hier wieder ähm, in den nächsten Wochen und Monate zu sehen bei Tropical Underground. Ich wollte nur äh, zwei kurze Sachen sagen. Ähm, erstmals, ähm, dass ähm, den ähm, Programm ähm, haben Sie alle vielleicht schon gesehen. Wir haben diese schönen Heftchen und die Plakate, die überall in der Stadt äh, hängen. Ich wollte noch kurz äh, darauf hinweisen, dass wir nächste Woche, ähm, wir haben es angekündigt, dass wir den Film äh, Amulet de Todos von Rogério Esganzela zeigen. Leider werden wir den Film nicht zeigen können. Stattdessen haben wir einen Ersatzfilm, die auch sehr spannend ist. Also diese äh, Lilian M. Relatorio Confidencial von Carlos Reichenbach. Ähm, und das ist auch ein sehr spannender Film, aber nur das werden wir auch zukünftig auf unserer Webseite und überall ähm, ankündigen. Das ist ein Ersatzfilm bei der nächsten Termin am 26.04. hier im, im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zeigen werden. Das will ich schon vorab sagen. Ähm, heute Abend haben wir ein sehr, sehr schönes Programm. Wir haben ähm, auf einmal unser sehr spezieller Gast, äh, Max George Hindere Kruß, den äh, Professor Vincent Rediger noch näher ähm, vorstellen wird. Und dann haben wir äh, die Vorführung dieser sehr schöne und fast unbekannte Film Mangi Bangi von Neville Daumeide. Und vor dem Film werden wir auch noch eine Botschaft von Neville selbst zeigen, ähm, wo er auch ein bisschen über den Film spricht. Deswegen wird es ein sehr schöner Abend. Wir haben eine wunderschöne 6 mm Kopie aus dem äh, MoMA Archiv äh, ausliehen können. Äh, darauf freuen wir uns auch sehr. Und ähm, genau, ich äh, wünsche alle viel Spaß. Wir werden zunächst, wie gesagt, eine Lecture haben, dann eine kurze Pause, danach äh, den Film und im Anschluss ein Gespräch mit äh, Vincent und Max hier haben. Deswegen lade ich auch alle ein, äh, nach dem Film zu bleiben, um mögliche Fragen und äh, ja, Gedanken hier auszutauschen. Vielen, vielen Dank für das Kommen und ja, wir sehen uns äh, spätestens äh, nach dem Film. Dankeschön. Okay, ja, vielen Dank äh, für die äh, Begrüßung, äh, Laura. Äh, üblicherweise ist das der Moment, in dem ich auf Englisch wechsle, aber bei unserem Gast heute Abend äh, ist das gar nicht unbedingt notwendig, denn wie der Vierfachname suggeriert, ist Max Georges Hinderer Cruz, Bürger zweier Welten. Ähm, er spricht auch akzentfrei Deutsch, obwohl er heute Abend auf Englisch sprechen wird. Das ist eine Wissenschaftssprache. Ähm, äh, und deswegen erlaube ich mir jetzt die einführenden äh, Worte äh, kurz auf äh, Deutsch zu machen. Wir stehen also am Anfang der zweiten Hälfte unseres äh, äh, Programms Lecture and Film, ähm, äh, Tropical Underground, das Cinema Marginal und die Revolution des Kinos. Diese Reihe ist, äh, wie viele von Ihnen wissen, Teil einer größeren Veranstaltungsreihe, die eben auch unter dem Titel Tropical Underground läuft. Äh, wir haben mittlerweile eine äh, sehr lehrreiche Website ähm, aufgebaut, die heißt www.tropical-underground.de, ähm, in der Sie einerseits äh, alle Informationen über die noch anstehenden Veranstaltungen in diesem Programm finden werden. Äh, neben den acht Filmabenden hier im Filmmuseum ist es eine internationale Tagung, die am 23. bis 25. Mai äh, im Museum Angewandte Kunst stattfinden wird. Im Übrigen mit einem Filmabend hier im Filmmuseum mit äh, dem großen Star des Cinema Marginal, Elena Inés. Ähm, und äh, am 13. Juni gibt es eine Literaturveranstaltung im Musanturm und am ähm, ähm, 21. und 22. Juni ähm, noch eine Veranstaltung mit den Super 8 Filmen von Elio Chisica, diesem bedeutenden brasilianischen Künstler, ähm, von dem 
von dessen Installationswerk äh, Tropicalia, die Tropicalia-Bewegung in gewisser Weise ausging und äh, diese ganzen Avantgarden und äh, Untergrundentwicklungen, äh, mit denen wir uns äh, in, unter verschiedenen Gesichtspunkten im Rahmen von Tropical Underground beschäftigen, äh, ihren Ausgang nahmen. Elio Gisica ist das Stichwort für die Vorstellung unseres Gastes heute Abend. Ähm, Mar Max äh, Jorge Hinderer Cruz ist einer der großen Spezialisten des Werks äh, von Elio Gisica, dem äh, ähm, mittlerweile als bedeutendsten brasilianischen Künstler der zweiten Hälfte des 20. Jahrhunderts anerkannten äh, Plastikers, ähm, Performance-Künstlers. Ähm, und äh, Max hat äh, äh, zu Elio Gisica eine Vielzahl von Publikationen vorgelegt, darunter auch ein Buch, das er gemeinsam mit ähm, äh, Sabit Buchmann für MIT Press ähm, herausgegeben hat. Max ist äh, freischaffender Autor, Kritiker, Kurator ähm, und arbeitet äh, im Moment auch an einem größeren, äh, philosophisch angelegten Werk über eine globale ähm, Ästhetik im Zeichen der Dekolonisierung. Und, und das ist der Grund, weshalb wir ihn heute Abend hier auch in diese Reihe eingeladen haben. Sie können ihn im Übrigen gleich nochmal sehen bei der Tagung. Da spricht er dann über Elio Gisica, aber heute spricht er über Elio Gisicas engen Freund. Ähm, Neville de Almeida, ähm, dessen großer Champion Max in gewisser Weise ist. Nicht? Wir haben vorhin darüber gesprochen. Max hat gesagt, niemand sonst interessiert sich für Neville de Almeida. Ähm, ich ich, ich äh, bringe... Äh, ich kümmere mich um, um ihn. Ähm, und der Film, den wir sehen werden, ist eine außerordentliche Rarität, der auch lange als verschollen galt und äh, auch in gewisser Weise eine ephemere Geschichte hatte. Also er wurde äh, einmal äh, am, äh, in New York aufgeführt und galt dann als verloren und ist jetzt wiederentdeckt worden. Und äh, heute Abend, und das ist ein besonderer Treat, äh, können wir tatsächlich die letzte existierende 16mm Kopie aus dem Museum of Modern Art dieses Films Ihnen zeigen. Darauf freue ich mich ganz besonders, aber jetzt freue ich mich zuerst mal auf den einführenden Vortrag von Max. Vielen Dank, dass du hergekommen bist. Uh, Max Horche, Hinterer Cruz. Hallo, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming, um, finding your way here in such a lovely day. I was walking along the river. It was uh, really lovely, so I appreciate you actually came into this dark room. Thanks a lot to uh, Vincent, uh, Laura, Lili, and uh, Pramila, who is projecting um, for their help and um, guidance. And well, yes, I'm going to speak about uh, Neville Dalmeida's Mangi Bangi, which is a, a very rare film. And uh, I, that's why I would like to map a bit the, the context of it, like how it Uh, came into being as a film, what the context of the film was historically, and also how we should, um, what, what we should take into consideration when we want to see and appreciate the film. As Vincent has said, um, there's only one copy that is kind of circulating or in archives, which is the one we're going to see of uh, MoMA. It's a restored copy, um, and there's one private copy of uh, Neville too. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to talk uh, about how, how the film came into being, but before, um, there's something very uh, special I would, I would like to address. Um, I, I'm not Brazilian, right? I'm, um, I'm actually Bolivian, German, German, Bolivian, however you like. And somewhere in between these two countries where I spent my whole life going back and forth, I decided to, um, to want to live in Brazil, uh, uh, specifically to research these tropical underground things, yeah? uh, uh, starting with uh, Elio Tisica. So I started um, researching and meeting a lot of personal friends of Elio Tisica because this was my entry point. And one of them, one of the most important ones, I would say, since the work I've uh, dealt with the most is called uh, Block Experiments in Cosmococa. I'm going to show some images later. Uh, video uh, slide installations uh, that Elio Tisica made together with Neville de Almeida. Uh, so one of the most important persons for me to meet and to exchange was Neville. Uh, Neville is a, a particular 
kind of filmmaker, let's say, because he's kind of standing on the margin. We can talk about cinema marginal and so on. There's like these big representative faces of cinema marginal and everything. But Neville is kind of between, amongst the cinema marginal directors, he's kind of a marginal figure. And that's because he doesn't really, he doesn't really seem to fit in in any kind of um, drawer. So um, there's a lot of uh, things to say about him, which I will do in the following. Now, the, what, what is really important to me, since um, I, I guess that a lot of you people have um, been following uh, uh, here the, 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 the series of lectures, so you, you might know a bit about Brazil. Um, the most important I found out, speaking with all these uh, personal friends of Elio Tisica and people of, of those times, of, of the 68 kind of turn, let's call it, in Brazil, is that they all always say how important it is that we remember that Brazil was under military dictatorship when all these things uh, happened, right? When all these works were produced, uh, Tropicalia movement, uh, Mangi Bangi, all these films that you've been seeing in this series, they all um, were made during military dictatorship. Now, um, as you might know, the situation in contemporary Brazil uh, today is, um, is, a, is a very difficult one. And uh, the city I live in, Rio de Janeiro, is actually uh, living under military rule right now. I'm not aware how conscious you are about the situation in Brazil. Uh, Brazil has been, let's call it, um, interrupted and its democratic process in 2016 with the impeachment of uh, the former president Dilma Rousseff. And uh, the interim's president, Michel Temer, um, has now, about two months ago, uh, passed a law per presidential decree that uh, Rio de Janeiro should be military intervened. Um, this is not the first time uh, somewhere, some place in Brazil gets military intervention, right? Usually it's, uh, uh, it's considered as a security measure because of uh, drug, trafficking, uh, drug trafficking, violence, etc. So it's a measure for the safety of the population. However, um, this time things are different. Uh, 2018 is, a, is an election year, both uh, for Brazil, like federal elections, and for the state of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the military intervention in Rio de Janeiro has for the first time, and this is something you don't hear in the news, and even people in Brazil are not really aware, but I'll just give you like a, a sort of analysis of what, what happens, because I think it's important we understand that we're living under military rule in Brazil. So what happens is that per military decree, and this is different than all the other military interventions that happened um, for the first time in an election year also, right, for the first time, uh, the Congress is paralyzed. So the Congress of Rio de Janeiro has no decision power anymore, right? So in 2018, which is the period of this military intervention, which was um, declared by, by presidential Decreed, I actually wrote an email to Frank Walter Steinmeier, which is a fun, fun story, um, <laughs> because I met him once and, and we had lunch. Uh, and so I wrote him an email and said, uh, look at what is going on. But uh, the presidential uh, secretary here uh, says that they, cannot, they, they don't consider this a difficult situation because it's all happening according to democratic laws and the constitution. So what happens is that the president which is a non-elected president, has uh, passed a decree which says that in an election year, the Congress can no longer take any decisions. They, they may vote, but they cannot impose changes. They also don't uh, have uh, authority over the budget of the city, right? So the biggest part of the city budget is now in the hands of one military general who also is in power Right? So what we usually consider a democratic state in modern history is a state in which uh, the powers are divided. Right? We have a division of power that is in between juridical power, executive power, and legislative power. In this case, um, the militaries have taken over uh, the Congress, so to say. So there's, uh, the legislative power is in the hands of the military. 
the uh, Brazil as other South American countries uh, um, has its executive power uh, executed through the military police, since the military police is on the streets. So in that sense, uh, the, the, the reinforced presence of the military police and now real military corps with uh, uh, tanks and stuff on the beach of Copacabana, for example, um, which you don't see every day, but you do see it, um, is a reinforcement of the fact that the executive power is in the hands of the militaries. And last but not least, um, the same presidential decree, and this is also new, has reinforced, and this is a strategy that has been passed through uh, by Maduro in Venezuela, also by Evo Morales now in Bolivia. Um, and it's not a left-wing thing because Temer is not a left-wing president. In Brazil too, um, the militaries got freed from um, the possibility to be judged by a, a civil court or by any court that is not a military court, right? So only the militaries can take military actions uh, to responsibility. So as I am trying to tell you, uh, the division of powers is completely suspended, which makes Rio de Janeiro a de facto military regime, right? And in these times, it's uh, particularly interesting to, to find out, and this has to do with the film, this is why I'm, I'm telling you, um, so when this happened, I got totally uh, anxious, right? I started to think what is happening. So I needed to, um, I'm writing this book right now. And uh, so I, I'm in what I call my ivory tower with a beautiful view over the Bahia of Guanabara. And uh, so then I got all this news and I, I figured out I have to go on the street because I didn't know what was really happening. I wanted to know how it feels on the street. So I went on the streets, uh, took part in assemblies and reunions and so on and figured out nobody really knows what, what is happening. Nobody really knows what is going to happen. And after the first week where everyone got a bit nervous, suddenly it seemed like that everyone, everything is just going as normal, right? And that's when it got me. That's when I thought, wow, how, how, I'm, I'm 38 years old. Uh, I was born in 1980, during actually uh, uh, during a time where my mother was uh, politically persecuted uh, because she was a, a, a militant against uh, the military government in Bolivia at that time. So um, I thought military uh, regime is something of past generations. My Bolivian mother lived a, a military regime and fought against it in, in Bolivia. My grandparents in Germany, I do have German grandparents too, um, I used to have, they, um, they lived Nazi Germany. And uh, I thought I would never live it, but I do live it now, right? And the most curious thing of living a military intervention, military government, I tell you in my experience, is that everything just seems as normal as it did two months before, right? So I go on the street and I think like, how come not everyone is screaming and, and, and throwing in windows and putting cars to burn, right? It doesn't happen. So imagine Frankfurt, 1934. How was it on the street, right? I heard that Sartre was in Berlin in 1934, and he didn't even notice, Sartre himself didn't notice what was going on. So imagine what, what it means to live in a military dictatorship. I'm telling you this because I think it's, it's important when we speak about 68 culture, counterculture, Brazilian culture, that these people were living a very harsh repression because suddenly you could disappear, right? Suddenly you could be pulled in and, and be tortured, like many actually did. Um, you have to flee. Suddenly you can, like some four weeks ago, Maria Lefranco, uh, city council of Rio de Janeiro, got shot nine times in the head in a public execution on the street. This can happen just suddenly, right? Um, but then you go on the street and everything just seems very normal. And you, you have, we have to be a very, I think conscious that the things that are going here in Germany too are, are dramatically putting uh, the democratic situation into, 
to check. The German government, as far as I understood from Rio de Janeiro, had a problem of about half a year not being able to, uh, to form a government because only on numbers there was so much democratic right-wing votes that it just didn't work out to form a government, right? Excuse me, if, correct me if I'm wrong. This is my interpretation. So, however, these people, like Neville Almeida, in 1971, during military dictatorship in, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, decided to do a film about what he says, and I think he says it also in the video we're going to show later. Um, he wanted to do a, a film about things that he never saw in cinema, right? And things he never saw in cinema, in cinema, in films, were what I call the little rituals of everyday life. It's boring stuff, you'll see it. <laughs> you have 60 minutes of stuff that kind of everyone will do or don't. Um, and you'll just see all these things happening. And it's the little rituals of everyday life. It's like the normal, the normality, right? So as we see what, what it means actually to have a normality during military dictatorship, it's interesting how Neville, I think, and this is what calls my attention, draws our attention to, to what the normality of hygiene rituals is, taking a shower, taking our fingers and smelling our body, passing it everywhere, and um, drinking coffee, taking amphetamine, um, uh, walking on the street, just things every, we all do or don't. Like, but, but you know, it's like daily, daily business. Um, I think this is, this is so interesting because this film is really about repression and normality, right? So I think this is um, also different than other films from, from that period in which um, somehow the military oppression um, and the fact that people were censored, etc., was much more played to the forefront and much more considered the, the content of the films. It was performed in a much more dramatic way. We're being censored, there's military dictatorship and so on. I think. Um, Neville shows us in a very different way, very unspectacular, oh, it, well, it depends. I think it depends on who sees it. And, but compared to, you know, all these Glauber Horsha, or I think you, you showed Senge Saranyas recently, Skanzella, with all just screaming people and, and, you know, shooting and screaming, and it's just loud, uh, the sound is oversaturated, um, it never stops. Uh, people running around, it's all dramatic and put in scene. And, and here with Neville, it's, we don't have direct sound, um, we don't have dialogues, uh, we just see people in the shower and on the street. And so it's a, it's a very, very different way to, to look at this. Now, I um, had the chance, and I'm very uh, thankful, to speak a lot with Neville. There is no real texts about Neville. There's like, I think, two websites with some little essay on Neville. Um, but there's no real literature on, on his work. And I had the chance to, to start a project in 2013 uh, in, in when we came here to Berlin in, in the context of the Berlinale, of the 63rd Berlinale, where um, the documentary of Elio Tisica's uh, nephew about Elio Tisica was shown and even won two prizes. Um, we brought Neville because we showed one of these cocaine slide show installations. Let me show you some images. This is the name of the... And we, we I'll show you some installation shot, like this, for example. So we, we, we made one of these installations, which is a slideshow environment with a soundtrack and... Uh, and these photos, the slides are um, book covers, uh, LP covers, etc., adorned with uh, cocaine powder and other devices. However, so we brought Neville, and we also had the chance to show Mangi Bangi in Berlin in a gallery space for contemporary art uh, in a very small situation from a, from a DVD, so it was a very bad quality. But it, it was nice uh, to show it. And then we started with Neville, to talk about uh, his life. 
<laughs> and I started a project which I call um, uh, the Berlin Tapes, which, uh, which is a reference to, to a series of tapes that Elio Tisica made, which are called Elio Tapes. So I said, we're going to do Neville Tapes. And we do the Berlin Tapes because it sounds nice. And then, um, so we started to have these conversations. So a, a lot of the stuff I'm going to tell you uh, comes from, from these recordings. And it is real, like, anecdotal. It's like Neville um, being really comfortable in a Berlin apartment, uh, drinking, uh, eating, smoking, and talking about when he went to cinema the first time, uh, how it was to, to do these films and so on. So I would like to tell you a bit about Neville, who I, um, v v Vince has, uh, has said it. I, I, I like a lot to work on Neville because he's a person who I think unrightfully has been a bit uh, disregarded by historiography and also by researchers of, uh, of Elio Tisica. First of all, because he was really important in the creation of the Cosmococcus. Uh, he's central. One might say he's the inventor. Um, and, and second, uh, because Neville is just a, a person who I think uh, challenges all the categories we have in mind. Um, so what, what Neville said as, as a, um, I'm going to get to that later. So Neville is from Belo Horizonte, was born in 1941 in Belo Horizonte in Minas Gerais, a state in the southeast of uh, uh, Brazil. And he, um, he was, when he was six years old, he was on a, on a road trip with his father and they were in a car and they went through the interior of Rio de Janeiro and they stopped at a little kiosk. And those days, the easiest way to find a kiosk was to go to the, to the local cinema because every cinema had a little kiosk. That's how Neville tells me the story. So um, he asked his father, what, what is this house? And his father says, um, well, it's a cinema. And Neville asks, what is a cinema? And his father tells him, well, go inside, check the curtain. Just go through the curtain and you'll see. So Neville goes inside this interior, you know, countryside, interior, small city, uh, in the interior of Rio de Janeiro, goes into the cinema, opens the curtain, and stares at the huge close-up of uh, 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 Rita Hayworth uh, in uh, Gilda, right? So, and Neville tells me that it was the most flashing, credible, magnificent uh, image that he has ever seen, right? So he opens this curtain, you have to imagine someone who's never been to a cinema and sees, as he says, the wall kind of moving, and there was this face of Rita Hayworth, and so beautiful, and he would instantly understand that this was something that he wanted to have in his life for the rest of his life. So he later joined the, the local uh, uh, cinema club, in, which is like a, a film screenings, like a, a cine, cinema club in, uh, Berga, in, in Belo Horizonte, and he well, he gets enough fiction now. Then he studies theater, and later he goes to Rio de Janeiro after traveling also through the U.S. Uh, and Europe. And he um, comes to Rio de Janeiro, where where there's a really effervescent situation, right, in the mid '60s. Uh, and he meets all these people, like all these Scanzerlas and Brezanis and Oiticicas and Rochas and and so on. So they would all kind of hang out together, work together. So, for example, I, th I think you've seen O, o Bandido da Luz Vermelha. Uh, Neville appears in that film at some point. He also appears in Singa Saranya. He, he's just, he's part of, of that group, right? He would somehow be part of them. But Neville was somehow never really into it because, uh, as he would say, the cinema of these guys, of these marginal and cinema novo, it would be either too uh, forefront kind of political, it would have a too fixed political discourse, or it would be so formally challenging, right, that it would demand a sort of understanding of the spectator, which he felt was uh, authoritarian. 
So Neville would say these guys are making films that are actually forcing the spectators to somehow, you know, uh, get into a certain state of mind to to be able to understand the film. But if a, if a, if a film director would want his public to understand the film, then this would already be an authoritarian situation. And uh, uh, Neville considered himself thoroughly libertarian and said, there's nothing that can touch on the freedom of the spectator and there's nothing that should touch on it. So this was a basic difference. Uh, another difference that Neville points out, Neville did his first uh, uh, um, uh, feature, which was called Jardin de Guerra in, in 67. 67 was a, 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 I think, significant year for Brazilian cinema, particularly for the for the underground. Or uh, it was it was the year of Terra Trance, It was the year of uh, Bandido da Luz Vermelha. It was the year of uh, Cara Cara. It was the year of um, Jardim de Guerra. And uh, what Neville said, which is interesting, is that Bandido da Luz Vermelha, Scanzella, no? uh, 67 was a was a big, actually commercial success, right? Uh, uh, Bresani didn't get arrested. His film didn't get censored, and but Neville's did. So when you talk with Neville, Neville would tell you, these guys they are radical, you know, they are political, they are experimental, they are good friends of his, you know, he's not saying, but they didn't get censored, not in '67. The one who did get censored, his film taken away, and uh, some uh, uh, parts of the film cut out and uh, irrecoverably lost was, uh, uh, was Neville. So Neville says that this, from 67 on, his relation to cinema would change drastically compared to the others' relation to cinema, because the others, as Neville would say, would be privileged enough to not be censored while he was getting censored. So he did a second film in 1970, which I didn't find any, um, I'm sorry, no still or, this is a, a poster which was drawn by Ruben Gerichman, a famous artist, uh, which was called Piranhas do Asfalto. Uh, Piranhas may also mean sex worker prostitute, um, so it's not the fish, right? Um, and uh, what, what Neville always had uh, as a topic was uh, some sort of, uh, Sex was always part of, of what he was dealing with and violence, right? So, so Neville's films kind of do turn around sexuality and violence, mixed a lot with what we would call these rituals of everyday life. So um, I've never seen Piranhas do Asfalto, unfortunately, but one of my favorite uh, um, Brazilian actors, actresses, uh, I just found out now, uh, was part of, of, of it, uh, which is uh, Betty Faria, who, who uh, did this wonderful telenovela, Estieta, I don't know who, who saw it. It's, she's lovely. Uh, however, so a very young uh, uh, Betty Faria was part of Piranhas do Asfalto. And um, in that moment, 1970, is the year when, when uh, Bel Air, you know, the Bel Air production firm, which is Elena Inez and and Rogério Scanzella and, and Julio Brezani, I guess that you'll see quite some films of them here, they, they come into being. And they flee, Scanzella and, and Brezani, Inés, flee to London in 69, and, and they edit the material that they filmed in Brazil before and start launching these films, which is Sem uh, Aranha, well, they, they kind of launched all their films in, 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 in this year, 70, 71. A at that moment, again, uh, Neville stays in Brazil and, uh, and does Piranhas de Asfalto, who gets, again, uh, interditado, which means it, it, it doesn't pass the censorship. It gets uh, uh, cut apart, uh, partially destroyed, and never circulates. It comes to that point that uh, Neville D'Armeida, as a young filmmaker, had realized two long uh, feature films, and none of them was ever shown publicly. They never made it to, to, a, to a real cinema screening, right? So he was quite frustrated. 
about this development. And obviously, as you can imagine, he had these great friends who are doing these great films, and, and, and they don't get censored, but he gets censored. He gets really, like, that was... He, he was he was being more and more frustrated, right? Like how how can this be? He did two films, none of uh, none of them could be shown because of the uh, military repression, uh, and so on. So he had become this kind of figure who helped himself out by doing little businesses. He was a he was a he was a kind of. Uh, uh, I I like to to. What's Camelo? Mm, like a street seller. He was kind of the street seller of the Cinema Marginal uh, in, in Brazil. Neville had everything that filmmakers or Bohemians would need, starting from drugs to batteries for the camera, lights, film, material, celluloid. He would, he would be able to provide you with whatever you needed. That, that was Neville. He kind of played his way. Um, through, through that world, trying to do a film which could uh, finally pass. So in 60, no, in 1970, no, in 69, wrong, sorry, in, uh, uh, in 1970, it must have been in 1970, uh, the, the first film, Jardin de Guerre, he makes a small exhibition inside a, uh, an editing studio, which is called Lider Cinematográfica in, in Rio de Janeiro. And he invites some selected five people from these New York, uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, context. Amongst them was uh, um, Celso, uh, José Celso uh, 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 Martins Correa, Correa Martins, uh, the, the famous uh, theater director, who, as Neville says, at that moment was still a kind of uh, uh, closed off, uh, in the closet, very concerned, kind of uh, uh, well-dressed, young, ambitious theater director, and not as what we know him today, right? So he was there, and uh, the famous poet Wally Salomon was there, and Wally brought Elio Etisica, right, the inventor of uh, of the Tropicalia thing, and. Uh, um, Neville and, and Elio instantly get very good friends because Elio Etisica is fascinated about uh, uh, Neville's film, Jardin de Guerre. I, I took this uh, film uh, still here, which shows a, a scene of an interrogation in the film in which uh, um, they use slides. You see the slide projector on the, on the table? And um, this use of slides within the film and filming the projection is something that Elio Tisica gets absolutely fascinated about. And he goes up to Neville and says, you know, we need to do something together. I think this is so amazing. The other thing that uh, uh, Elio Tisica is fascinated about uh, uh, Neville's film language is his use of posters. So Neville would spend a, a big time running around the city filming uh, Ajitprop kind of posters in the city. And he would film them like a Mao Zedong poster or a stencil of Che Guevara or whatever. And he would go and film this and would, would kind of uh, structure his film by these uh, takes on a poster like on the street like for a few seconds and, and so on. So um, at that moment, uh, Elio Tisica says to, to, to Neville, and I think we should go together to Mangi. Mangi is a place in Rio de Janeiro, was a district in the center of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, for those of you who know Rio de Janeiro, there where today is the Sambodromo, like the big samba, uh, samba exhibiting structure, like the big, uh, 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 it's like a stadium for a samba, for the carnival events, right? That whole area, which is pretty big, used to be that zone, which was a, a prostitution zone uh, where misery reigned. It was like, as Neville says, it was like the, it was like the really, really, really poor prostitutes who would live there. <coughs> so the rich ones were in Copacabana, and I don't know, and he told me about where all the different prostitutes would be, and the poorest ones would be in Mangi. And uh, Wally Salomão and Elliot Sika, they were friends of Jose. Jose 
was the daughter of, a, of a Otto Dopo. Otto Dopo was a, a big drug lord of uh, Mangueira and he of the favela. And his daughter had a, had a prostitution house in Mangi. And this is where Elio and, and Wali would hang out. So Neville says, wow, this is like, this is a big bang for him, right? So it was Mangi Bangi. It was like Mangi kind of rocks in a way, if you like, right? No, not only positive, but it's like, a, it's rocky there. So the, 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 the name we might lead back to, to the Mangi Bangi, to his experience in, in Mangi, uh, which as you'll see in the film, uh, has to do with what, uh, while I uh, talk about rituals of the everyday life, Neville would prefer to talk about um, rituals of misery, that's his words. Neville says that he, what this film is about is about rituals of misery. And you'll see a lot of uh, trans prostitutes doing reproductive work, domestic work, like washing clothes, putting them up, etc., children, and, and so on. So you, you'll see what this is about. So again, to come back, um, Monkey Bangi is a film about, first of all, um, things that Neville Dalmeida never saw in cinema before and he really wanted to show. So he says, how come everyone uh, poops every day and smells his own poop? How come this, nobody shows this in cinema, right? So we'll have the chance to, <laughs> to see this, for example. Um, so this, this is a film that is structured by these rituals of everyday life, and which are at the same time the, the rituals of, of misery in a situation that is highly, as I said, oppressive, and a situation which each and every figure you see could just be dead right next moment. Hmm? This is important to understand, that these rituals of misery and of everyday life are performed just on the fringe of, on the fringe, on the fringe of, of a possible sudden death. Um, uh, and there's a, um, they, they exist like a, a protagonist. There, there is a, a, a narrative structure in the film that, uh, as Neville told me, it's the story of, of Paolo Viasa, who is actually the Badido da Luz Vermeia. Uh, you'll recognize him probably. There's two protagonists in this film, Mari Gladys, who is in Senha Saranha, next to Elena Inés, a protagonist, and Paolo Villasa, who is, a, who is the very bandido de Luz Vermeer. And while Marie Gladys just kind of floats around the film and performs her relation to her body, um, uh, Paolo Villasa, as we will see in the very beginning and through the whole film, is a stock exchange broker in Rio de Janeiro, and who goes through an experience that Neville Dalmeida explained to me as the, um, as the enlightenment moment of uh, uh, Paul the Apostle. Neville, for those who, who don't know, Neville knows his Bible like thoroughly, completely. Neville doesn't travel, doesn't sleep without a Bible next to his bed. Neville um, is a, a believer, and he's from a uh, Pentecostal Evangelic Church of uh, Minas Gerais, uh, which doesn't keep him from being the um, uh, subversive person he is and, and do what you'll see him doing and all these things. Um, so, however, he knows his Bible, right? And he says that Paulo Biasa, the stock exchange broker, uh, the, 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 this is the story, the narration that goes through the film. He um, gets, as you'll see, like some sort of spasms and then goes through a radical transformation that leads to a perhaps unexpected, <coughs> perhaps very expected, uh, line of development we would usually call a, a, a regression to a primate being from the stock exchange to the primate being. Um, it's very interesting how uh, I think in a moment, 71, where, where uh, uh, there is a lot of misery in Brazil, like literally people starving, particularly in the, in the Northeast, there was big uh, uh, droughts and, and starvation, famines, uh, and a lot of investment of, uh, amongst others, uh, uh, German enterprises 
is uh, I very recommendable. There's a, if you if you really want to know what the situation 71 in Brazil is, go to the Spiegel their Spiegel website and check an article of Hubert Fichte, who was in um, in Brazil at that moment and wrote two big articles which were published in 71 about uh, German financial interests in the misery of uh, of Brazilian people. Very very recommendable. However, um, the situation was uh, the situation was very dramatic, and uh, uh, in that moment the stock uh, the the stock exchange broker um, has some sort of body reaction to what he's doing and goes through this process. And Neville described this as Paul the Apostle on his way to Damascus. Paul the Apostle, for those who, who don't know, I didn't know. Neville told me the story. Um, uh, the Apostle Paul, he was actually a, a persecutor of Christians. He was a Pharisian, Pharisaer. Uh, he was a, he persecuted Christians, and he was really into Christians, the followers of Jesus. Um, and on his way to Damascus to I don't know for whatever he gets this vision, and he gets uh, I, I call it enlightened. He gets blinded by some light, and he's blind and. But then he sees again, and he gets uh, he gets conscious about what he was doing, and then he becomes himself a Christian, right? So this um, transition of Paulo Villasa, uh, according to Neville, is the, the 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 same sort of experience of a 1971 uh, stock exchange broker, right? So what he converts into is this person who gets conscious about his own body and how the everyday life is being performed. So um, Neville at that moment uh, decided, OK, I've been censored twice with my two first feature films. Um, now I, I, I want vengeance, right? I, I'm going to make a film that absolutely for sure won't pass this. Uh, uh, the, the censorship, right? I'll, now I'll do a film that will certainly be censored, and he did Mangi Bangi. He, did, <laughs> he filmed it also because he was already on this trip. We were talking about it. He filmed it in a, in a reverse, uh, Vincent, how was it called? Reverse, like on, in, in, a, in a positive? Yes, reverse negative. Reverse negative. So it's like, it's like slides and photography. So he filmed it in a, in a reverse negative, which means um, the, the only copy that existed was the, the the negative itself. There's no negative. There's only one positive. And with this uh, film, with all what we're going to see, he uh, after filming it, he also went to London, where a lot of people were. Gilberto Gil and, and Caetano Veloso were there. Scanzella and Brisa and Inez were there. Neville also goes to London in seventy <coughs> uh, one, and uh, and decides to. To cut it there, there's this, uh, there's this. Uh, his cutter of Jardim de Guerra, who's called uh, Gerardo Veloso, who is also from from Minas Gerais, Belo Horizonte, and an old cinema club uh, friend of his, the one who did the the, the 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 cut, like the edition of Jardim de Guerra. He was in in London, so he decided to do the edition with uh, uh, Gerardo Veloso. The um, since, as you'll see. We're all having all plain sequences, uh, so there's not much. There's not much to cut, if you like. He says that the main editing work was actually producing a soundtrack. There's no direct sound uh, in this film, but uh, they produced by mixing a sort of um, uh, well, yeah, just a soundtrack um, that that, as you'll see, sometimes just falls apart. So don't wonder if suddenly there's no sound anymore and it sounds like the the apparatus kind of broke, or the, the loudspeakers crashed down, or so it's just part of, of the film. So Neville, who was, who was really uh, afraid of what he had created, this film which, with which he wanted vengeance and saying, like, I'm going to show you, um, thought it would be a better idea to, to even develop the film, this positive, like this reverse negative in, in London. So, because he thought that there was more freedom to, to do so, while in, in Brazil he feared he could really get into serious trouble because you could get right into prison and so on. So, as Neville says, even in London he would, uh, he would deliver the film to the laboratory and get a call afterwards, 
when this was ready by the guy of the laboratory saying, you better come here and get your film quick or we'll call the police. <laughs> like, so <laughs> Neville was really uh, surprised that like all these, uh, um, you know, the swinging 60s London, like the Rolling Stones, the Beatles and, and so on, um, there, there was a, there was no such thing as liberty, not even in, in London for Neville d'Almeida. So he then did the work with Gerardo Veloso and brought the film to New York, where, um, again, uh, he, he, he met with uh, Elio de Sica and showed him finally what he had filmed, uh, 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 departing from what they had talked about when they met and decided that they wanted to do films together. And they uh, managed to arrange a small screening, again, private screening with some uh, 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 celebrated um, uh, Brazilian intellectuals who were in New York at that time, also in exile, amongst them Elio Tisica, uh, uh, the, uh, the Campos brothers, the, the, uh, the famous poets, right? And uh, uh, I think Giulino Brizani was also there, um, probably. Well, he's Salomon, I'm not entirely sure. But it was a small group of, you know, like these illustrious um, Brazilian artists, intellectuals. And they see the film at MoMA, and as it seems, um, the only copy, existing copy at that moment stayed in MoMA and kind of got lost. We don't really know exactly what happened. But we know that I think in 2006, a Brazilian scholar, uh, uh, and a uh, br brilliant scholar, by the way, who wrote a, a book about uh, uh, the marginal culture, like Marginalia, in Brazil, uh, and a book about Elio Tisica's uh, writings in New York in the 1970s. Fred Coelho, uh, Frederico Coelho, he went to to research Elio Tisica in in New York, and he knew that Elio Tisica had assisted a lot of films from the film archive from MoMA. So he goes to MoMA to see the films that. What Isika saw in order to understand better what his mood was, or what he was consuming, and then he bumped into Neville Dalmeida's Mangi Bangi and couldn't believe his eyes. This film really exists because up to that moment it was more like a legend. You know, people would talk about uh, uh, Mangi Bangi, but as a matter of fact, only five people had ever seen the film, right? So, so it was a legend. So uh, Fletch found it and uh, tried to get in contact with Neville, managed to get in contact with Neville, and they negotiated MoMA would do a, a restoration, being aware of the value, immense value this uh, piece has, and they made a copy which they could give back to Neville and keep one for their archive. So today we have this super rare chance to um, broaden the circuit of five people. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was shown otherwise, uh, uh, but... but um, it's very rare to have it in 16 millimeters, and I, I'm really excited of the chance uh, to see it. So, uh, without more things to say, uh, just that the, the the vengeance of Neville, right? That he said, "I'm going to do this film. I'm going to show them. I'm going to do this film where I showed things that I never saw in cinema, and uh, and this film is not going to pass any censorship." Well, today we have the chance. To see it, just to just to sum up, and I'm going to uh, to le leave you to see the film. Basically, um, uh, the, the vengeance of Neville came actually earlier, and this is also one of the reasons why he never really wanted to fit in, or never really actually fit in this group of of intellectual experimental filmmakers, because Neville had huge successes, like really huge successes. Adama de Lotasson uh, is probably his most successful film. It's considered one of the most seen films of Brazilian cinema ever. It's the story about Sonia Braga uh, being the, the, the wife of some like really like conservative uh, uh, man who works all the time and she just feels desire and her need to like let her desire as a woman flow and she start, she, she goes uh, cruising basically on public transport, right? Lotasão means uh, bus, public transport bus. So she's the, the lady of the bus, if you like. And she uh, does these cruising experiments, which was revolutionary in 1978 to present a uh, self-empowered, an empowered woman that would have an empowered desire and would go public with it, if you like. 
So this became one of the of the most famous films of Brazilian cinema. And later he had some other successes that go more into the direction of what was uh, known, you all might know, of the... Um, oh God, what's the name of it again? Forno Chanchada, exactly, which kind of has some sort of to do with it. And Rio Babilonia is, is probably second most famous one, which tells the the obscure story, like the, the hidden histories of the Brazilian middle class during dictatorship, like what to do behind closed doors. And, and, and this, this uh, is considered to be the film with the biggest uh, TV audience ever sent, according to Wikipedia, uh, in, in Brazilian cinema. Uh, yeah, in the history of Brazilian TV and cinema. Uh, yes, so finally, now, Many years later, we'll see what uh, Neville brings to us in form of this 1971 film uh, about the things that he never saw in cinema and that deal with the little rituals of everyday life and the craziness uh, of everyday life and the precarity of this, as Neville says, um, rituals of misery. Thank you very much for, for your attention and I hope you enjoy the film. Later, I think we have uh, the chance to have a Q&A. Um, the film is about 60 minutes long. Um, and I'll be at your disposition to talk about whatever you like about the film. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Max, uh, for this great introduction. We're going to have a five-minute break now in case you still want to get something to drink or go outside a little bit, but then we'll restart. We'll start with the screening, and like we said, we have this uh, special message that Neville wanted to share with us. We contacted him. Um, we needed his authorization to show the film, obviously, because he has the rights of the film, even though we got the copy from MoMA. And he was very excited about uh, the fact that we're showing the film here. And he said, well, I'm going to record a video and I'm going to send it to you. So he has his own, we will see him uh, with a video he did in his backyard uh, shortly before we then do the screening of the film. Yeah, and between the message from Neville and the film itself, there's also like just a break just so you don't Wonder why it's all, uh, yeah. Yeah, in between the film. After half an hour, you have to change the reel. Exactly, you have to change the reel. And then, yeah. okay, during the film, there's also a short break because of the reel of the 16 millimeter projector that we need to change, and there's also a break. So just enjoy the evening and relax in case there's anything that you were wondering. There's, everything's okay. And yeah, enjoy, thank you. <laughs> Além cinema, after cinema. Eu queria falar sobre o Mang Bang, que é muito importante o contexto de quando o filme foi feito. O filme foi feito em 1971. O filme tem 71, 81, 91, 2001, 2011, 48 anos, 47. Existia uma ditadura militar no Brasil. Existia uma censura, existia tortura, existia morte e assassinato por quem contestasse a ditadura. E naquele momento, eu estava começando o cinema, naquele momento, era o meu segundo filme, e eu falei, eu não vou aceitar a ditadura. Eu não vou aceitar a censura. Eu não vou aceitar a tortura e eu vou fazer um filme que eu nunca vi, com todas as coisas que eu nunca vi no cinema e estão na vida moderna, na tua vida todo dia. Todas as coisas que você faz todo dia, a maior parte delas não está no cinema, porque o cinema é só encenação. Então foi uma decisão de fazer tudo que eu nunca vi no cinema de fazer plano a plano, de fazer mudo, de fazer mudo e com trilha sonora única, sem mixagem, apenas ligando uma música com a outra, apenas ligando um ruído com o outro. Fizemos com uma equipe de quatro pessoas, fotógrafo genial, 
Pedro de Moraes, filho de Vinícius de Moraes. Atores fantásticos. O ator Paulo Vilas, um dos maiores atores do mundo. E a gente conseguiu ali, então, filmando plano a plano, um por um. Não se repetiu nenhum plano, não se repetiu nenhuma cena. Todas as cenas foram originais. Todas as cenas foram criadas e feitas só uma vez. E dessa forma, nós fizemos o filme com 70 minutos e montamos mais ou menos com, com, 50, com 60, 70, 75. É... O filme era tão forte que não podia ser exibido no Brasil, não podia ser mandado para a censura, que o filme podia te levar para a prisão, para a cadeia, que o filme era uma prova contra você mesmo. O filme entregava você. O filme era um filme nunca visto, nunca feito. Levamos, fizemos esse filme e ele passou 35 anos desaparecido e reapareceu há cinco anos atrás, graças a Deus, no Museu de Arte Moderna de Nova York, no MoMA, onde o filme estava guardado. Então, é muito importante para mim essas características que eu disse do filme ter sido feito na ditadura, correndo muitos riscos. Depois, pus o positivo na mala, levei para Londres e editei em Londres um ano depois. Foi editado por um grande cineasta, Geraldo Veloso. Eu quero é, agradecer por ter feito esse filme, por ter tido a coragem de fazer esse filme, por participar da história do cinema mundial fazendo alguns planos antológicos jamais feitos na história do cinema em nenhum formato, em nenhuma forma. Então, e eu quero agradecer o fato desse filme passar na Cinemateca de Frankfurt. Obrigado a todos. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Elio Itisika later would describe Mangi Bangi as a as a, um, insta moments or limit situations. He would speak about these kind of exploding moments in time, capsules of time that Neville would capture with the camera on, on celluloid. And later, actually, this would be the ground, the very groundwork for their slide installations, which are the block experiments in Cosmococca, where you actually do have a very complicated processualization of, of time and experience time within a, an altered sort of uh, chronological time, which is a slideshow, etc. Right? It's a very fragmented flow of time. and. Uh, so I do think that the encounter of, of them both sensibilized uh, Neville to a very high degree of what the visuality of his films, like the surface, is actually about. According to Neville, he, he did the slideshow and filmed the slideshow in 67, uh, like long before the Cosmococcus, right? Mm. Um, because he knew slideshows from his church. Okay. He did, they did uh, uh, parties and then they would make photos of the parties and then they would make parties where they show the slides of the last party and would have another party, right? Like church life, communitarian life, yeah. like slideshow parties. Right. So this is when Neville actually got into slides. And uh, so he would do it intuitively, he said, but, and he would film posters because he liked all these posters on the street. And then Elio would come, like Elio, this nerd kind of head, and he would start talking about uh, symbolic language and the, 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 the language, this like visual language he uses with time and slides. And so Neville, who did this more 
um, intuitively yeah. in the first place, uh, got radically conscious about what he was doing and that this was actually constituting a language, a visual language. So I think that a lot of the conceptualization of the images we see come stem out of this encounter of these two different forms of artistic production. Um, one more observation. Uh, I mean, you pointed out and uh, Navila told us in his video message that it was about bringing to the screen things that were not normally seen, like going to the bathroom and shooting drugs, even though we were talking about the fact that there is a similar shoot drug shooting scene in Chelsea Girls, and then later in Lady Sings the Blues, Diana Ross can be seen shooting herself up um, in in the late 70s, so it becomes sort of a mainstream motive, but it's still it's it's, it's still a radical moment. But the film also tells a, tells a grand narrative story, which is the, the regression of the man of the financial world of the homo economicus uh, who uh, you know uh, re regresses into pre-civilization and early childhood stages and then disappears right. i mean that's how the film ends disappears into the to the jungle um so it's, it's sort of a reverse uh phenomenology of the spirit if you will uh, uh, right uh, yeah. Uh, so, so the story also has a, a grand narrative to it, which gives it its coherence. Or how, how do you see that? Or would you agree with that? <clears throat> yeah, totally. Uh, I mean, there's there's this, you know, these uh, these instant moments which kind of frame the whole thing. All these rituals, right? The the ritual. I I hope you understood what I meant when I said these rituals of everyday life and. Mm. So I think they they are in the forefront. Like in the second half, in the second reel, we actually get the story of Paulo Villasa having this regression. Uh, I think it has a very different quality to it than the pretty natural kind of first scenes, let's say the ritual scenes. And then there is some acting, and then there is some. So it it kind of coexists, I think, in uh, in a way. But there is this this narrative, and 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 I think that what what uh, according to what Neville told me, uh, it is about to to uh, in the everyday life rituals and the life of uh, like Paulo Viasa, uh, both have in common that it's about uh, discovering oneself and one relation to oneself. So this regression. But as I said, uh, Neville also pointed out in an interview that he sees this progress uh, regression or transformation of Paulo Viasa as a uh, uh, the Apostle Paul um, moment right. of getting blinded and then converting, right? So... Um, also, I mean, you could situate it in, as, as we do in this series, situated within the larger context of uh, Brazilian culture and maybe also the, the anthropophagic... Uh, Thinking in 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 the sense or or reverse rationalism, uh, which is a, an important figure of thought also in Brazilian literature of the seventies, sixties and seventies, um, where uh, you know there's progress is made, but it's not going in the direction where it usually goes in Western grand narratives. You know, towards more enlightenment and and civilization. Uh, he's actually going back to the to the jungle. I'm, I'm not sure if I, I'm very sorry I have to say this like this, but yeah. but I, I, I think that the, the anthropophagic yeah. idea is overrated. Uh -huh. okay. like, um, I think that uh, he, particularly here in Europe, okay. people try to get everything under the anthropophagic kind of narrative, okay. what, what comes out of a certain context. Yeah. And it's really not like that. Mm -hmm. like, I think all these different filmmakers you have in your program have very differentiated takes on uh, Osvaldo de Andrade in the Anthropophagic Manifesto and what this anthropophagic culture could be. As a matter of fact, one of the hugest, biggest critics of the anthropophagic anthropophagization of culture is Rogério Scanzerle, mm -hmm. who has a brilliant uh, critique uh, on what he, he calls like, like a, a, something like a stupid uh, kleptocracy. Yeah, what what others say, the great subversive anthropophagy he calls like kleptocracy, and uh, it's it's interesting 
to see how this takes. Uh, Elio Tisica himself was a big um, was a big uh, critic also from relatively early on, from 1970 on. He would radically criticize also the mainstreamization of certain tendencies. So I think that the, it, it, it's 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 a good thing to look at it very differentiated with the anthropophagic issue, like um, the idea that Paulo Villasa in the end goes back to the jungle. I think that probably the jungle is also kind of probably more important than the f he in fact goes to the jungle is that he passes through a regression or so, right? Okay. I'm not. I'm not sure if if we don't over. Style. No, no, I'm, I'm absolutely. I mean, we, we shouldn't homogenize uh, right. uh, all these phenomena under, under yeah. this particular rubric. Do we have questions from the audience? Yes, please, two, right away. Thank you for having given me the uh, possibility to see the film tonight. I am from Haiti. I have always something to see, to say also when I see such a film, and particularly it fails me the black element in this film. All those people uh, at the bank, and only one was a black man. It's not the particular point. The particular point is uh, during all those uh, um, back to the roots uh, in the story of this modern man, this recession, regression, it on, only at that point you have the black element in the music. How could the author explain that thing? And particularly beautiful, you know, those, those uh, Afro-Brazilian thing with, with fight and the, the air, how you call it? Capoeira. Capoeira, all right. Yes, it's, it's it's a good observation. I I always think um, the um, in in this particular film, I have to say, I find it difficult to to do a quantification of black representation um, because I would have counted more than one black person in the film. Um, but but this might may differ from you know uh, uh, Brazil is a country where which which has a, about sixty percent of self assumed. Afro-Brazilian people, um, a lot of them might have been as, as clear-skinned as some of the people in the film. So I'm I'm not sure whether you, you know what, what I'm I'm not sure um, how to quantify the the black presence from from the visual stage. What I certainly can say, which I think you're totally right, is that there's a misrepresentation of black elements in music and in, in the representation of it visually, right? I think in the music it's particularly strong, and this is something that actually irritated myself when I saw the film, that some of the, probably it's a, it, it is owned to the very ideological situation, let's call it, of the, uh, uh, white middle class Bohemia, uh, where these all all these filmmakers come from, um, to exoticize uh, uh, difference uh, in a way that they thought it is liberating, right? For for the white middle class Bohemia, where Neville Dameira comes from, Roger Scanzella comes from, all these people come from, um, the inclusion of black uh, or, or let's call it Afro elements like. Um, the capoeira music is in a way um, to state a kind of uh, uh, statement against a hegemonic culture which is white and Eurocentric. Right? So, but obviously, and I think um, that this is something we should be well aware about, this is a setting that is kind of ideologic of white middle class people, right? they put it like that because they think that this is how they could subvert the establishment by including uh, Afro-cultural elements. So in a lot of films actually, be it Ivan Cardozo, Rogério Scanzerla, Brizane uh, Notant, uh, um, Global Hosha also not that much, but 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 uh, uh, at Neville here in this case, you do have it, um, you have the introduction of black culture as a kind of um, 
it's very it's very uh, it's very unsensitive to just take it put it there right because because it's kind of very schematic in their perception i think also because they do not have very much a uh, connection to it right they are white middle class people they don't have uh, 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 much contact with Afro-Brazilian culture, as a matter of fact. Um, so I do think um, that there is a lack of, for example, all protagonists, if you want, are white and are white middle class Bohemians. Um, this is something that I think we have to be well aware of this, this whole uh, um, scene that is uh, considered the cinema marginal is a white cinema. So there is a there is a, a a lack and and certain problematic aspects about the representation of Afro-Brazilian culture. I'm, I totally would would see that. But I don't make a particular point at that thing, but only general thinking. Because the first time I met a white Brazilian in Germany, he was an educator, a young. I was so young as he, and his first meaning of the Brazilian society was to say to me, well, everything we have in Brasilia comes from the Afro-Brazilian culture. We have the football, we have the music, we have the way the people dance, we have the way they eat everything. And it's the discrepancy now I, I found in this film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... Um you know the, the 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 question of how African Brazil is 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 a uh, very, uh, very broadly discussed and very heterogeneously discussed uh, thing. It's a very broad topic. I I don't want to you know dive into it now because it would take us forever. But I think that there's certain there's certain aspects we we could we could highlight. Um, 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 there's narratives that are actually really reactionary in my sense, uh, uh, openly uh, resist, uh, like racist, that do talk, that, that do have an understanding about like general Brazilian culture as all this mixed culture. I don't know who, who that uh, white Brazilian you met was, on which side he was standing, if you like. Um, but there's a lot of Brazilians I have found out that come and say like, we're all black, you know, like, uh, uh, we're all Indians, and all our culture is African, but they actually straight reproduce segregation and, and, and racism on all levels, right? So it's a very tricky issue because the whole history of Brazil is about how to eradicate blackness from <laughs> from Brazilian society by at the same time pretending that it's all racial democracy. This is the whole history of Brazil, right? Brazil was the last country to abolish slavery, globally, the last country to abolish slavery and very contrary to Haiti. Um, uh, and at the moment slavery was abolished in the beginning of the 18, uh, 19th century, the um, the Afro-Brazilian population was five times as big as the white population, which might be one of the reasons why the whites didn't want to abolish, because they were the ones who could decide, no? right? So um, I have found out that one way to understand Brazilian history up to the present is to figure how these sixth part of the Brazilian population managed stay in power up to today and control the country just as they did. Um, so a lot of these contradictions and these contradictions are rooted in, in these nice white middle class Bohemian filmmakers which do the tropical underground and all these things. These to figure out these contradictions is crucial to understand how this actually worked, right? And I think, and I do have, um, some African friends I, I really like to discuss these things about um, who are from South Africa, who have obviously the experience of apartheid, etc. Um, 
with whom to discuss racial democracy is really interesting, the concept of racial democracy. And we figured out actually how um, this whole tropicalization and this whole tropicalia discourse in a way served to some sort of really hypocrite, uh, 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 I almost wanted to say social democrat, but, but like, uh, like a hypocrite uh, uh, multicultural discourse mm -hmm. which would propose that in Brazil there is some sort of racial democracy through culture, but as a matter of fact uh, mainly served to, um, to calm the bad consciousness of, of uh, middle upper white middle upper classes, right? This is very crucial to understand how also avant-garde film has contributed, white avant-garde film in Brazil, as the films we're seeing, have contributed to the myth of racial democracy in Brazil. It's crucial to understand that. And I thank you very much for your observation. So and in Gramscian terms, the, the white middle class is a, um, a, a hegemonic minority. Yeah, if you like. Yeah. Um, just, just I don't a quick like follow. to use minority and that's, but, but yeah. They're, they're less Num numeric. People. Numeric, Manor. yeah. I mean, you you, then you, offer, you opened up a calculus of power. Uh, right. Which I think is is important. Uh, it, it's an important uh, perspective to develop. Um, before we move on to the next question, I just want to um, bring up one element of the film that's interesting in this context, namely the presence of Jimi Hendrix and the Jimi Hendrix impersonator. Right. <clears throat> and, and in a way, you could say Jimi Hendrix was the first black rock star, or the, the first... You know, oh, there were others before, right? Yeah, but crossovers, uh, crossover stores who play distorted guitar. I don't, I don't know. I mean, Ike Turner no. is not really. Uh, it's. I think. I think that the Jimi Hendrix was a real avant-garde artist, and mm. he was very much respected by all these Brazilians. They were all crazy. I. I don't know. You've seen. Uh, 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 Bandido da Luz Vermeia ends with this Jimi Hendrix sound mm. on this kind of apocalyptic alien invasion. Right. Um, Rogerius Canzella has done uh, uh, two films on Jimi Hendrix, actually. Right. Um, uh, Neville Almeida has Jimi Hendrix very present, and Elio Tisica has Jimi Hendrix very present. It's it's like a there's a lot of Hendrix going on in right. in in that. Uh, in that place. What I only learned by talking with these people is that really, um, I've heard Jimi Hendrix from very early on in my life, but I was never that aware how revolutionary his music really mm. was. And uh, I think the moment when I really got, when I really got it, was when, the, when I saw for the first time this uh, video recording of uh, the Monterey Festival in 67, mm. when Hendrix burned his guitar uh, and made this... Uh, ceremony in which he burned uh, burned his guitar and kind of evoked spirits and you know it was very charged yeah. um, and uh, uh, um, and you see the faces of the people in the audience it's amazing you know all these white people they are shocked you know they think like what is this probably they never saw a uh, 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 um, a black rock star before or whatever and, uh, it, it, it certainly has to do with this but the faces in the audience are just incredible and that's when I understood that um, there was something about Hendrix that was really different and once you start paying attention to the sound and then you compare it to other sound of the time you understand that Hendrix made something with this instrument and with the technical conditions of an electric guitar via amplifier feedback um, that was unheard of, right? So, so the fact that Hendrix was doing something else than playing guitar by using a guitar, I think was the, was the fascination for these people. Oh, well, and, and just to, to add, the guy who is the Hendrix impersonator, he's called uh, Damião Experiencia. Mm -hmm. And he used to be like a legendary figure of the kind of uh, underworld in, in Rio at that okay. time. All right. We have one more question over there. Thank you for giving the talk as well. And uh, also thank you to the gentleman for the observation because uh, at first I also wanted to ask what you could say about the uh, choice of music uh, at that particular scene. But I have another question. Because uh, thinking about the background of the filmmaker as a believer, 
as you introduced him, and thinking about um, the narrative of revenge and seeing these scenes of ordinary life, which you also said he would see as scenes of misery, um, as an revenge, as an attack on uh, the repressive government, military, and also the uh, representative morals. Is there some kind of conflict between his own Christianity and the normative Christianity embedded in the things he's attacking? I always wanted to know more about that myself. To be really honest, for me, when I found out that Neville is um, in an evangel from an evangelic context, like Protestant, right? But Pentecostal. He, um, he, he really surprised me, right? Because everything I had known about him would seem like totally opposed to, to what I had in mind uh, um, a Christian person would do or want. Uh, or so Neville is a very particular person in that sense, I think. And, and um, the, the, the Brazilian context, also has a lot of these um, uh, um, subversive Christian elements, like Brazilian history. Um, there's like like liberation theology, just to start with, from the Catholic side or so. Um, I think which has been really important and strong, and is even really present in in Cinema Novo or so, where you know these stories are are kind of. Um, are very present. I think um, it's such a difficult thing because I don't know any answer myself. The only thing I know is that it's important that we are aware that Pentecostal evangelical churches and neo-Pentecostal evangelical churches are two different things. And like hyper-reactionary tendencies that we have today a lot in Brazil, which are from the neo-Pentecostal evangelical contexts, um, differ from Protestant Pentecostal, let's say, older uh, uh, contexts, in which uh, um, believing in the word of, of Jesus was really like some sort of uh, 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 um, considered to be a, 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 an opposition to poverty, basically, and trying to build communities in order to, to, um, to fight uh, poverty. So we we might well sensibilize ourselves that not all Christian people are horrible. Um, yeah, I, th I think you know it's fair to say yeah. that in the his in the particular history of Brazil, there's many different, be it uh, uh, Protestant or or Catholic examples of people who have uh, fought. Um, for the rights of the poor and political liberation, including race wars, etc. Um, so that's um, I, I just fair to mention. Um, I think it's a it's a great and important question, and I mean uh, we need to tread carefully, and and uh, you know it will be interesting to go back and actually ask him about this. But uh, right off the bat, I see two elements that would support your a kind of reading that this is a film that is made by someone who's profoundly spiritual uh, but probably opposed to some kind of conservative Christian dogma I mean at the at the core of the evangelical whatever the denomination is of the evangelical movement is is sort of the the experience of awakening and and the um, the centrality of personal experience of personal spiritual experience which can be ecstatic and and so if, if you look at it through that uh, framework, I think the depiction of drugs and and uh, the experience of, of uh, drug-induced ecstasy acquires an entirely new uh, meaning. Um, and the other thing, of course, is the dignity of poverty, which is a, a central element of, of uh, um, a certain strands of, of sort of Ren uh, you know, spiritual renewal in in Protestant and evangelical movements. This is not what what American evangelicalism has become. You know, the American evangelicalism, mainstream evangelicalism, is now a gospel of prosperity. 
So it's it's more important, you know, your your experience of God is uh, to be rich, um, which is which is a, a, a complete perversion of, of the original uh, meaning of Christianity, if you will. So I think that's I think that's a very important uh, observation and something that might actually provide a cue for understanding what's going on in this film. I really like that what you mm. said. It uh, it helps me a lot to think about certain things, particularly what you say about the dignity of poverty. As a matter of fact, I did talk with Neville about the dignity of his um, uh, personnel in his film, like how he films them, right? Because he goes into a real miserable quartier, like a district in, in Rio, and he just puts the camera on them, right? So you could also think he's in a, in a way feeding on uh, on them, right? On, on their situation and so on. So according to Neville, what he actually tried to do with this film, very conscious about what he was doing, was to find how to maintain dignity of these persons while filming them. This is according to what he said to me. Right, I, I think it's arguable whether and how it this worked, or whether and how this can work in a like such an experimental um, approach as this is, uh, particularly because nobody has a voice. Right, they uh, it's a it's a there's no direct sound. Um, um, but I remember now, just because you you came up with this, that Neville talked specifically about you know trying to approach through poetry visual poetry, as he said, um, to find a way to present these people, to, to, to maintain their dignity while filming them. I don't know if this helps. Yeah. I mean, uh, one way to, to attack the film would be to say, this is a white middle class artist who goes slumming. You know, there was a, there's but, a whole thing about the go slummy. And yeah, the, but I don't think that's what's going on here. Um, that's not that's not what the film looks like to me. Interesting about the center of Rio de Janeiro is that it's the center, right? It's not a, a favela. Mm. Like it's not like Senhor Saranya goes to the favela of Copacabana, or it's not like Elio Tisica goes to Mangueira. It's not like all these other films that have this element uh, which sort of led to a sort of romanticization of the favela. Mm. Uh, I mean, this is just a inner city, urban center context. It's slightly different, I think. Um, there's another form of transition, and especially the fact that it's a prostitution kind of hotspot uh, makes that there's a lot of fluxes of people coming and going, right? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, m maybe w one of the shots that... that we could bring up here is the one where the um, the transgender prostitutes stand at the window that the group of you know where they sort of look at the camera which is again is a beautifully composed shot it's not artificially lit but the lighting is absolutely fantastic and and that's why that's would be for me one of the ways in which you know he films them he films these people in a way as to render them their dignity uh, rather than just uh, speculate voyeuristically about what kind of kinds of lives these people leave, uh, lead. Oh, we have a question here. Yes, yeah. it's nice because you give me a good cue here. Um, the problem with this is that there is no narrative to this. There's no narrative to what? To, to this specific specific shot that you're mentioning, it is a attraction shot, really, and um, I I really fail to see the fascination with this film um, personally also giving the the little informational background that he really wanted to make a film that should be censored or like would be censored given that it, it, it appears to me as something that is made by an angry kid more than by somebody who thought about narr narration and, um, and, and, and and creating dignity with elements that um, mainstream or uh, that that an establishment would find difficult to to consume. Yeah, let me think. He was thirty years old. It was his third uh, long film. He 
it's it's fair to say he was relatively young right like um i think it's a good observation also i i i really think um i can totally understand people who don't like this film like absolutely for for me it's more uh, it's more important because of my um trajectory as a researcher and uh, because it plays such a key role on on understanding certain things that i actually researched you know uh and uh and it's such a rarity and it has such a fascinating history around it that i just love it you know like it's uh for me for me as a as a as an object of study it it has a, a big value and for me it was fascinating to see it in 60 mm i'm really happy um to have had the chance to see that quality and stuff but um as very often you know like i'm i'm very pessimistic with uh um with culture and also with avant-garde culture uh specifically with this kind of self-assumed super progressive white avant-garde culture and um so i think uh, uh um probably what you say it's an angry kid doing it is what i would find is its quality you can say it's like punk or so you know it's charged with a vital negativity if if that's not a contradiction but a ne negativity that vibrates and it is full of life right while being negative so this is pretty much punk for me and and even use the same drugs and stuff so so it's kind of you know it uh, uh i don't think that this film points towards something constructive uh as we found out like the, the regression is to to the kind of zero point if you like and so that's uh that's interesting it's it's a very interesting observation to think that it's an angry kid it's like irony so it's supposed to be ironic but in the end it's it's like um very subtle it has nothing to do with irony i think maybe also here you wanted to be like you wanted to be like more like that guy the guy above said but in the end it's not what he actually got i didn't find the f uh, it to be like a like an angle kid i think it was very kind of calm and subtle and it's all like the idea of irony uh, i didn't get why 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 the ir why what do you mean with irony some people want to be ironic about things or if but then the end result is something completely different right right yeah you know i've learned that that these these works they might just very well be really contradictory in many ways and i think one of our big challenges in culture is to be able to to uh to stand these contradictions and to keep them up and not to think that we have to like synthesize everything to some sort of like hegelian perfect state of un, you know like uh because a film can be like a very trashy punky negative thing at the same time have these like wonderful compositions that Vincent was talking about you know and have a very thoughtful thing element to it too this can happen you know at the same time um i think it's interesting that while for example another contradiction which we had uh, talked before right that while there is a representation of afro brazilian uh culture in it uh, and probably the the filmmaker himself would have seen it as a, as a great uh um important element like uh, for example a, a high chin spectator as we know now just perceives it completely different right i think these kind of contradictions we need to we 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 need to keep them up and it's important to keep them creating a tension between themselves because we, we really don't win i think we we really don't win anything by seeing this film and saying what a wonderful film let's go get pissed now at the next bar or so you know this this is not what it's about and i and and i and i think that it's our duty to question this cultural production just also from its very button right to say like society is more complex than a film could ever embrace so let's see what we can get out of it you know what what, what we can make out of it um in the ideal case we can learn something even if it is to say i don't know why people like this film 
yeah, it could be a good contribution to a festival. Yeah, uh, I mean, rediscovering this film doesn't mean that we uh, need to end up saying it's some kind of masterpiece. Uh, that's, I don't think, what's at stake here. Uh, this is why I said when, when we started the discussion, I don't want to drag this into an art type of discussion. And um, I keep on being fascinated by what you perceive to be, I think, rightly so, but then again, in a way, maybe also not the contradiction between his um, evangelical background and the life he led and the films he made. Um, I'm tempted to go off on a tirade here uh, <laughs> and say one of the problems that we have and one of the challenges that we meet when we deal with the art of a place like Brazil and also Africa is that we, um, and I'm speaking here as a white Western European person, have unlearned to understand um, uh, spirituality as a, as a kind of, as, a, as an element of human experience. And um, the, I mean, as you said, you know, you, you cautiously said, probably not all Christians are bad people. That is the kind of, you know, enlightened left-wing position that we need to need to take because we've learned that uh, we, 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 we're, we've, moved, we've moved past that, you know. Uh, we're too enlightened to be uh, Christians or somehow spiritually inflected. But, um, you know, my limited experience of Brazil is uh, there's way too much of that kind of stuff going on there to just say it's all backwards and regressive and, and stupid. And if you encounter someone like Neville de Almeida, for whom this is a, apparently or evidently an important part of his biography, I think it's worthwhile taking it seriously. And, uh, you know, um, evangelical spirituality and organized religion, you brought up the, 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 the practice of doing slideshows and how that sort of informed his own artistic practice. This is a very strongly visually and narratively saturated environment. This is like going to church is like going to see Rita Hayward in the cinema. It doesn't leave, it leaves an imprint. And, and I think we need to take that seriously. Absolutely, I, uh, I, yeah, I totally agree. Do we have more questions from the audience? I would like to get some more information about you, about the religion you talk about, pen, uh, Pentecostalism and neo Pentecostalism. What is that, neo Pentecostalism? You know, uh, um, you, you have uh, um, you have all these huge churches that are called in, in South America we say evangelic churches, um, which is not to be mixed up with what is evangelic here, for example, in in Germany, which is the Protestant. And uh, then there's a certain context of uh, of evangelic churches. I'm not a, I'm not an expert, right? But there's a certain context of evangelic, like Protestant churches, um, that stem out, for example, of uh, um, black culture in the U.S., like uh, um, which are these uh, classical black churches. You, you you know we all know from 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 our imaginary web. You know there's a lot of singing and uh, and. Um, and there's also elements, uh, let's say, which which are traditionally from from uh, West African uh, uh, religious practices, um, which came with the diaspora, right? And uh, 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 like the incorporation, for example, of spirits is, is one w one of these things that that may happen in uh, uh, Pentecostal, but also in Neo Pentecostal. However, uh, religious practices. So what what um, this is a kind of, let's call it a tra traditional um, Protestant, not traditional, but, but a Protestant religion, a religion that I at least always kind of project to the 
colonial context. Please help me, anyone, if, if you know better than I do. And while the neo-Pentecostal uh, uh, context is also, as I perceive it in, in the colonial context that is in, in the US, very strongly departing from there from the 1970s on, uh, a development that comes together with, to, to project it on a global scale, together with neoliberalism, right? So you have a sort of spiritual, Christian spiritual uh, ideological formation that backs uh, the neoliberal overtaking of the American continents. And that is through structural adjustment programs and such, with structural adjustment programs in countries like Brazil, Bolivia, etc. you name it. Um, I don't know how it was in IT. Uh, it might have been the same story. Um, you have uh, uh, an inv invasion of NGOs that are like church NGOs. These NGOs are um, these new form of evangelic churches who propose basically a sort of, um, uh, how can you say it? Very, uh, uh, very, very uh, 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 reactionary, uh, um, moral tendencies, right? And they are sort of an ideological cleansing of the of the of of the uh, places that, that need to get restructured. Yeah, thank, thank you. And they uh, excuse me. There's one yeah. important yeah, aspect right. to it, which is that that these uh, neo Pentecostal churches, as far as I understand it, have a, a sort of enterprise structure, right? They they work. Um, they work like uh, enterprises and have uh, uh, an, an interest in uh, gaining uh, income. I will try to clarify this question to, to, tonight on the internet, but I also as a question, because in Haiti, since about five years, there is a totally brutal development in the way of this Pentecostal religion, because uh, after the Earthquake. After the catastrophe of 2010, where in America the Pentecostal store, where those Haitians are paying a tribute to devil for the independence. Uh, exactly. The first thing. Now in Haiti, there is a, a disaster because those new sects have power, they have money, they have TV channel, and they are working all day, all night, reuniting people, 1,000, 1,500 people in 13 areas, like a football game, and they are making music all the time, and those people have to stand up to tell about their sins. And the, the government, or the people in Haiti, or the bourgeoisie has no way to counter the thing. It's really, you are looking at uh, people as a nation that is going astray. Mm -hmm. At the same time, for about 20 years, I was in South Africa. It was also for me as a Haitian something uh, incredible, something incredible to visit some friends of mine of the uh, middle class, black or uh, colored people, Everybody there has in his room portrait of American evangelicals. And only at that moment I understood that they didn't have any other place. They didn't have any other help from outside than those American right. missionaries right. who were good to them. And it's yes. incredible. Yes, well, uh, uh, now that you mention it, in, in Haiti, I, I remember that in 2010, there was a horrible massacre of uh, of uh, 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 of people that got really revolted by NGO, uh, neo-Pentecostal evangelical priests uh, that would talk about um, to pay, right? To pay for their sins, and uh, there was a big like massacre of about 80 voodoo priests that were all executed by this mob that was 
uh, informed by these NGOs coming in to help Haiti after the tra the tragic uh, 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 earthquake. And this, for example, is a very clear moment of how these uh, uh, churches or NGOs have a, a, a aggressive, uh, fatal purposes, right? In Brazil, we have very big, very, very, very big problems with that. Like the newest issue is that the big drug dealers are getting all evangelical, right? So in Rio, you have a big fraction of evangelical drug dealers who exterminate literally uh, Afro-Brazilian religious cults in their neighborhoods. And like exterminate, we're talking about killing people on camera, uh, distributing this material in order to like really spread fear, and and destroying um, uh, cult places, uh, and so on. So um, uh, it's it's so difficult because it, it's just very complex, right? And I put it together with the story of neoliberalism because from the very beginning of the 70s on when like neoliberalism really explodes over the globe with a particular strong impact on uh, uh, the so-called development countries or so-called third world or whatever they used to call it in that moment um, is that the, 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 the social state of the, the modern state, right, it stopped being functional. Like from the very 70s on, uh, uh, social duties of father state, so-called father state, get reduced, 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 and it gets finally outsourced. It's the big privatization, the start of big privatization of uh, public health sector, education sector, etc. right? So this is what gradually steps in. And the more uh, 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 a social uh, fabric or let's say constitution, a healthy social constitution of, of a nation uh, gets eroded, gets uh, 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 attacked by privatization, the more these, and the less the state can actually offer anything to their people because that's not in their interest anymore. The more these people need some sort of help. And the brilliant idea of these criminal organizations because they're criminal, right? They, if they kill people, they're criminal. Um, is to have figured that out. These people need help. In Brazil, more than half of the population seriously need help. So they come and they offer a sort of communitarian fabric. They offer um, communitarian solidarity. You know, you go to church, uh, you lost your job, you quit drinking, and people will help you there. The state doesn't help you at all. But in the church, they help you, and you end up paying your tenth part of your salary for the rest of your life. It's, um, I think we cannot separate one thing from the other. Like a global development, the erosion of, uh, of, of the social function of the state and the overcoming uh, of society. Like it's, it's like, it's like uh, how you say, it's, um, it's digging a hole under the, the very social fabric that is just eroding, falling apart, and it will all collapse into this hole of these uh, alternative care kind of institutions. Um, so now, now we've wandered off into <laughs> it's all global. It's, I mean, it's, it's, all it's all connected. I mean, I, I could add that uh, right. it's no coincidence that the Catholic Church now has a, an Argentinian Jesuit as Pope. Um, Sub substituting substituting for uh, the lack of governmental services has traditionally been the Catholic uh, Church's mission in South America, and particularly the Jesuit order, and so they're they're basically just reclaiming territory. Now we have a paradoxical situation where the Pope is more left wing than, uh, you know, the competition uh, of in in the field of organized religion. So. Even though you may not agree that it's the greatest film ever made, you can say that it prompts discussions that lead into very interesting territory. Um, do we have more questions? If not, I would like to thank you, Mox. I would like to thank all of you for staying such a long time and for the discussion. And for, for what was really a very nuanced and, and very subtle talk and discussion.
I think this is one of the best discussions that we've had here. Oh, thank you. I like to hear that, of course. Thank Thanks you so to much. you. Have a good night. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Vincent. And like I said in the beginning, we'll see each other again on the 26th of April. Uh, Stephanie Dennison is coming from England to give us a lecture. And we'll be screening the film uh, Lillian M. Uh, from Carlos Reichenbart and not A Mulher de Todos, as we have put in our written program. But like I said, it's also very worth watching the film. And we'll be happy to see you all back here on the 26th. Thank you very much. Good night.